Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and Mike Huber is on today. Hello. There he is. And we have a brand new special guest who's never been on the show before, uh, Rixa Evershed. So tell us about yourselves, R- yourselves, Rixa. Are you plural <laughs> yourself? Nope. I'm just me. <laughs> okay. Just me today. Um, my name is Rixa. I uh, am a uh, early childhood educator, have been for 20 plus years um, and have really been um, all over the world and gotten to see the way um, early childhood programs work. I was an army spouse for 15 years. Uh, Most recently lived up in Alaska, moved to Washington um, right before the pandemic. Uh, (laughs) And so, yeah, well, welcome to Washington, right? And uh, I uh, am a play advocate uh from childhood I I really the more I think about it the more I realize that the way I grew up in the Colorado mountains um was deeply rooted in play-based experiences and so uh that is the lens um that I view most everything through and so just wanting children to have space and time to learn grow be be human yeah. Amen and amen. Yeah. <laughs> so a few weeks ago, uh, an episode came out where Mike and I talked about um, being sort of wary and careful about things that claim to be research-based or evidence-based. Um, and Rick, say you sent a message that this that same kind of thinking could extend to conversations about the achievement gap. So um, so we decided why not invite you. Uh, to be on the show and talk about it too, since you felt so strongly, uh, strongly enough to reach out. (laughs) Excuse me. So we have our starting quote. This is from an article called Not an Achievement Gap, a Racial Capitalist Chasm. I'm laughing because the episodes I did yesterday were all like patriarchy and capitalism. And so it just feels like a very heavy weekend. Um, A Racial Capitalist Chasm by Natalia Braginsky. And the quote to start us off is um, the use of achievement gap until then. So there's a bunch of course before this that leads to until then, but you'll just have to imagine that part until then the use of the achievement gap will simply be self-referential revealing more about those who instrumentalize the term than about the students they claim to help to put it another way. The achievement gap measures only the extent to which its, its adherents are resigned to leaving in place the systems that keep educational equity always out of reach. That's heavy, that's a lot. (laughs) But I have no doubt that we'll bring it into the real world as we we talk about this. But achievement gap has always been, like, you know, a lot of things I talk about on the show or when I'm teaching or training, I can say, you know, a long time ago, I did these things and, and now I, you know, I've, I've sort of moved a different direction after learning new things. And, um, I, I don't think I've ever been a big fan. I don't think I can say that about achievement gap conversations. Maybe I wasn't aware of it until I'd already started to kind of grow to a place where it wouldn't resonate for me. Um, but it's one of those phrases that I wish would just go away. I I wish we just didn't talk about it. Um, because it's so arbitrary, like the, the standards that we're seeing a gap in are just made up and assigned by adults and the timelines are made up and assigned by adults and it's our goals and it's not really anything to do with- And only certain adults. And only certain adults, yeah. So it's just, it's a frustrating topic for me and I'm interested to hear what you all are gonna say. <clears throat> I'd like to, to just name the elephant in the room of that it- it's the organizations that create the curriculums and and everything else that want us to believe that there is this thing Mm -hmm. that we need to overcome by um, bringing certain standards into the classroom certain um, goals into the classroom none of which are culturally centered or based in the context of with which a child lives they're just very generalized and if we look at at where we get a lot of these from. I mean, Piaget, Vygotsky, all of that are often quoted in this. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they're white middle-aged men that uh, studied white upper middle-class children. Sure. And, yeah. and so 
it feels like that title of that article was very apt yeah because it discards an entire group of children yeah in some senses it is really coded racist language we talk about achievement gaps and what uh-huh. we mean is those poor brown children those poor black children. yeah it's deficit um language right because mm-hmm. i mean it is that thing of all like, oh, those poor kids what do they need because what i've seen in a lot of programs i shouldn't say a lot the mm-hmm. programs i have seen that use that term a lot often then sort of like well we have to help these brown kids in our classrooms to have the things that these white teachers just had in their home and these kids don't Mm -hmm. so it's not based on what are the things these kids have in their house and it's assuming what they do have in their house yeah and assuming um and not valuing things that they have in their house necessarily if it doesn't match the experience of the white teachers or creators of you know the curriculum that Rick's mm-hmm. have mentioned so yeah that deficit is that it and that's a too often I've seen it as um you know this is the thing that oh we're we're doing this because those poor kids um literally poor kids yes which gets at there there actually is some evidence on what can close that opportunity gap mm-hmm. um and has nothing to do with what happens in the classroom Right, right. There's another Cash. spot. The <laughs> yeah, there's another spot that. Um, uh, oh, where'd it go? Shoot, where they talk about. Oh yeah, as many continue to disavow standardized tests, admitting they measure wealth rather than intelligence, we must also discard their offspring. And I think that's um, uh, where we are with achievement gap too. We assume, we assume that the the higher income is perfect and and better able to do what they're supposed to do with their kids and then anyone who doesn't meet that standard is disadvantaged or underprivileged or under-resourced and all these words that we use um when even using those words we don't we don't really want to do anything about why they're under-resourced or underprivileged or lower income we're not really right. doing anything about the real inequity um that can that can impede children's um progress for a lack of a better phrase of course i don't like that phrase um we're putting it all on the shoulders of a child to to meet these standards and to just work a little harder and if we are more rigorous with them they'll they'll close this gap um they'll be more white (laughs) a lot of times is what i'm what i'm hearing um but it's and we we shall say in more middle class too yeah 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 true I think I was like, oh, go ahead. Rick, go ahead, Rick, oh, go ahead Mike. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just wondering too, because we're, there's a tug of war within the early childhood world too. When you look at corporate childcare and some of the um, bigger chains of childcare and their um, partnership with a lot of these curriculum companies um, in kind of monetizing children Mm -hmm. so there's this this desire to have very full classrooms and little recognition within that particular space of what it takes to actually create a culturally relevant contextual contextually based Mm -hmm. um classroom that is um relevant to the children that are in it right Mm -hmm. and so you have this curriculum kind of coming into the classroom because we are going to make sure that the children that come out of of our classrooms are school ready and and so I think when we think about in in my head I think of the term school readiness or kindergarten readiness in the same way I think about the achievement gap Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think it has anything to do with how children actually learn and develop right Um, in my experience when we have spaces and time for children to um really explore their interests they are far more school ready than Mm -hmm. school ready we'll use that in quotes right than they would have been if i had been shoving the same themed curriculum into their brains for three years yeah Oh, I had something. It's gone. Mike, talk. Okay. Quick. Um, <laughs> so I was going to think about it, like, because I know a lot of the listeners are already kind of on board with play. 
Yeah. So I want to think about the other side of, of um, I don't know, achievement or what we look for. And that is some of the self-help skills, mm-hmm. right? And so this, <clears throat> um, a five-year-old being able to make breakfast for their younger siblings, something that low-income kids do all the time, mm-hmm that's not one of the things we think of. Like if we valued that, if we said, what is wrong with all these kids who can't like it's snack time, you guys go in the kitchen and make snack. Um, we'll be, I'll hang out with the infants and I'll come in in a minute. Mm -hmm. And yet there's plenty of kids who do that. Yeah. But you know, the people who, you know, and, and, you know, I'm of, I'm white middle class too. So I don't want to pretend that I'm not. And I didn't grow, grow up that way. Although my, you know, eight year old sister, would get us stuff sometimes, but, um, you know, like we don't value that part. So aside from the play and following your interest that way, there's also the, just the, there's plenty of things kids can do. Right. Um, you know, five-year-olds in some cultures use knives, they build fires, they build, you know, like all of this stuff, but we would never do that here because we're trying to get them ready for school. And we've right. already decided what school looks like. Um, yeah going back to Rick's thing. And, and we're really only trying to get them ready for the first couple of years of school. Like right. we're not, we're not looking down the road. We're looking at that screening to get into kindergarten and um, it, making sure reading scores are high enough to, to pass that third grade standard or whatever. Um, but it's done it. And Mike, what you were talking about is just amazing to think that there are people who would look at that child who is helping raise siblings at five years old and see a deficit and see only, oh, that poor family, um, that must be fixed and we must give them better skills so that they're not relegated for life to taking care of others and they can get a good job or whatever. When that is an amazing competence that child is showing and um, someone helped that child learn how to do that. So that's a family competence, mm-hmm. probably and strength. Um, but we only value these, these arbitrary test scores or, or reading milestones and anything else is seen as not as important. Or- it's not on a checklist. It's yeah. not making your siblings breakfast is not on the competency checklist. <laughs> Therefore, it can't possibly be a competency, yeah. right? Yeah. It hasn't been tended because I just, I, Mike, I was thinking about a lot, your analogy with the, the Yankees outfield oh. and colors, right? <laughs> and right. I, you know, it, we continue to dismantle, um, if we're intentional about our practice, um, the things that we've been taught are important, right? Right. Our mindsets around what children should know. It, it's, it's a, a continual process of acknowledgement, awareness, and then kind of breaking it down and reapproaching. And with that one, I mean, I thought about it for the last, since I watched it a couple weeks ago, a week ago, I don't know. Anyway, but I went into a classroom and they were talking about colors and, and the way this teacher was doing it was absolutely amazing. It was just a conversation about why the child had chosen what they had chosen. And there was no like direct rote kind of meaning behind it and then another teacher and because I teach in an independent school well I'm a director but I go from preschool all the way to 12th grade another teacher much more traditional was like wanting kindergartners to go through the colors and in my head I'm thinking like I know 18 months old 18 month olds that can tell you the colors so why in the world are we teaching it when they're five like (laughs) they passed that a long time ago Mm -hmm. and it has no meaning and so having a conversation with her um, about like, why are you teaching the colors? And just the continual, you know, I did the two-year-old thing of why, 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 why. (laughs) And it was really interesting to see how she got to a point where she just couldn't answer, like, why am I teaching Uh the color? And I think that like, why are we identifying achievement gaps um, that, are set are based on standards that are artificially created right and then and then making a whole you know group of children because those children know the ones that we have decided are far behind learning losing their learning 
they know what's, they may not be able to tell you, well, I'm considered the achievement, you know, the, the lower end of the achievement gap. Um, I'm the one who hasn't gotten to where I'm supposed to be yet, but they definitely experience that day by day by day by day in the way that they are taught and interacted with and, you know, maybe not listened to or not given opportunities that other children get. Um, and I don't know that there's just, there's nothing about the way we respond to this perceived achievement gap that is aligned with how, how children really learn or what we know children really need. And so we're, we're putting all this focus into the, the deficits we see they have. That's going to impact relationship. That's going to impact identity. That's going to impact how we can influence them or not influence them. And so that's, that's uh, damaging to learning as much as anything we think we're fixing is damaging. If that, if that makes any sense. Um, I just, um, well, let me ask you this. I wanted to, to hear what you guys thought from that, from that opening quote we used where they say it reveals more about those who use the term than the students they claim to help. Um, so how is it, how is it more meaningful to those people who talk about it and teach to it than it is for the children they're trying to help, do you think? Well, I think because the systems themselves are untouchable, mm -hmm. right? So um, so the one study I heard re recently, what, I forgot where it was, I think in LA County, Los Angeles County, where they gave families, low-income families, $3,500 mm -hmm. a month, right? Mm -hmm. And brain development increased or brain development looked a lot more mm -hmm. like middle-class children. Yeah. If we were talking about something that affected middle-class children, immediately there would have been a call for, we need to give everybody this much money. The opioid crisis that mm -hmm. you know happened, here's the perfect example of, there's been an opioid crisis for decades, but now it, you know when it hit white middle-class people suddenly it's like, oh my God, we've got to do something besides putting everyone in jail. Right. And the same thing is kind of happening now. Like, or no, it's not happening because it's <laughs> low income people. Sorry, that, that was yeah. my point. Yeah. Because we aren't addressing the system. So if we just, I mean, literally, if we took all the money that they spent on, you know, from coming from uh, No Child Left Behind and the um, every state having its own curriculum, like how much money was put into that, not curriculum, their own standards, standards, yeah, which then had curriculum companies putting money in and then, you know, selling a project, buying these things <laughs> selling a product, to yeah. meet the, the uh, standards that they decided we needed. We could have spent, took, taken all that money and given it to parents of low income kids, wouldn't even have to change the amount we spent, but instead of hiring people like me to like come up with these standards, I never did actually come up with standards, but, <laughs> um, but I've been at advisory panels for them. Admittedly. <laughs> you know, I'm the type of person that gets asked to be on an advisory panel. They didn't ask the low income moms in, you know, living in, you know, where I am now in, in St. Paul. And it's like, what do you find important? What do you want your child to do? Mm -hmm. Oh, we should make a standard about that. Or mm -hmm. what do you think if we gave you $3,000 a month, what do you think you would do with that? <laughs> do yeah. you think that would help your kid? Do you think yeah. you'd be less worried about your child? Yeah. Would you work less so you could, would you be able to work less and be, you know, be the gentleman, whatever mm -hmm. things you want to do, right. but instead, because those all involve systems, it's like, no, we can't change those things. We're going to do exactly what we've been doing for hundreds of years <laughs> and expect different outcomes. Right because there's money to be made. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, um, I actually had a conversation with the executive director of one of the places that I worked many years ago where I was trying to make this case that, you know, these are three, four, five-year-olds. What they need right now is to be three, four, and five. And we know that they don't, you know, benefit as much from sitting in a group and doing everything together and going through a school like schedule in a school like environment. Um, so if we, you know, if we provide what they really do need now, they'll be stronger when they get to school because they haven't, you know, had to sort of navigate this frustrating system of inappropriate expectations and, 
learning lessons about what they're, you know, the ways they disappoint adults in their lives. Um, and, and she said, uh, and this, you know, sometimes these, the higher ups are not early childhood people, but she was, and, and she said something like, but think about those children. Then they get to kindergarten and they don't know how to sit and stand in line and sit for a group. And so we're doing them a disservice because it's going to be harder for them when they get there. If we don't start training them now to act like they need to act when they get there. And I could not believe I was hearing it. Um, but now I, it's, it, I hear it all the time. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I can believe that that's really a thought process for a lot of people. Um, you know, and we did a, we did an episode a few weeks ago too, with a Michael Gramling quote from his, the great disconnect book, where he says, I've heard this before. If she's going to be miserable in kindergarten, then we should help her to be miserable now. So she's used to it. And, um, that's, that's where the achievement gap gets us. All this talk is robbing children of childhood it's so that one day they can, meet, yeah, they can meet a different adults on, you know, unrealistic expectations. <laughs> I've got them all primed for, um, you know, feeling like a failure. So when they get to kindergarten, and you it know, won't be a new feeling. <laughs> it's interesting that you talk about that. I, um, when, when I was still in the classroom, I taught once and I, so I was an infant toddler teacher for gosh, 10 years. And I have come to the realization that one, we don't prioritize infant toddler care enough. Oh no. Um, We do not give moms the money. We don't give programs the capabilities to provide infants and toddlers the kind of spaces that they need to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Um, But imagine there's, there's two things that I often think about that. Imagine if we were to give children programs like the childhood infrastructure so if you're thinking about Bronfenbrenner you have the child at the center with the the parents and the caregivers right around them mm-hmm. and then the centers around that um if you gave that infrastructure the kind of money that they would need to to really um provide those deep rich magical experiences for infants and toddlers they would then get to preschool right where no matter how many times I think about this, like people talk about, oh, we got to capture kids by three. And, and my, my argument is that no, we need to capture children much earlier Mm -hmm. and imagine the money that we would save just in remediation and all the kinds of things that we needed to do in the three, five space. Um, if they were coming in prepared with like, they had the food they needed, they had the housing they needed, they had um, the ability to get outside, you know, things like that. And then I see another disconnect between three and five when, you know, you have in, in some cases you have, you know, play-based, um, early childhood classrooms, um, where children don't necessarily need to learn how to line up or do sit in circle time for 30 minutes or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but then they go from that into kindergarten and, and all of a sudden, to your point, Heather, like they're having to understand like all these so, social norms that mm-hmm. they've not experienced rightly so. So who needs to come which direction, I guess, yeah. is what I'm thinking of. And, yeah. and of course, you know, with BCE being birth to age eight, I think often that it needs to, you know, play needs to, to, there needs to be a push up (laughs) instead of the push down that we get all the time. Yeah. And really all of this just serves to dehumanize children. Right. Yeah. So we've taken the humanity away from children um, by saying like, you need to know these things, your interests aren't important, you know, things like that. And if, yeah. (laughs) And I think the article brings up, is it, isn't that by design though? Because we dehumanize workers. Right. Yeah. So let's get them dehumanized early so that, you know, Keep like the rows of desks, like we, we need yeah. them to be able to sit in rows of desks at the workplace and just sit and do work. And of course, right. that's not what every workplace does, but but it seems like, I mean, that was the model, right? Like it's the let's factory. Make model. It like a factory. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, and just sort of like why wouldn't that be updated like that yeah i mean school culture again another system right of like mm-hmm. we need people to do what like yeah 
that makes no sense. Um, uh, and um, yeah, and it doesn't work for some kids, you mm -hmm. know? So it just, and then if you go to and do a gifted program, they that's usually not don't how they're learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like everybody knows, oh no, that's not the way to, we want these kids to actually learn right. and use higher level thinking. So yep. we aren't gonna put them in desks. We aren't gonna make them sit still. Yeah. We're going to have them actively working on their own, you know, projects and things mm -hmm. like that. And it's just, what if we pretended that all kids needed that, right? you know, <laughs> instead yeah. of learn to be the Amen. dehumanized drug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, so I was just talking about this with, um, with one of the classes that I'm teaching this semester. Um, and I was sort of making a list of the kinds of teachers that I've worked with over the years. And um, so one was, you know, the person who grew up playing school and thought they had a calling to be a teacher. And so they're really just still playing teacher. It was really just cool dramatic play when they were kids that they have inter interpreted as a calling. Or I've worked with a lot of people who really would rather be in elementary education, but for whatever reason, they're not. So they'll settle for early childhood for a while. Um and, and the people who go in it because they have a need to feel powerful themselves. So they, they see this group of young, young ones and, and that, you know, there's, there's a hundred other types that, that are more positive than that. But I think those are the, the folks that I think are particularly susceptible in early childhood to this achievement gap argument, um, because they, they aren't maybe, hmm, I don't want to make broad statements against any specific group, but some teachers that I've worked with, this would fit for them. Um, it's their ego that's, that's driving this. And if there's a deficit that I can um, demonstrate that I can push them out of or something like that, then I'm a better teacher. Then that's why I'm here. Um, rather than the people who are in early childhood and think, I need to figure out what children need at this age. How does learning really happen at this age? What kind of math stuff might be important um, besides calendar time <laughs> and, um, and start there, but it really, it does, it feeds a need for a certain personality type of teacher to, to function in this gap system. I find it interesting too. I know some teachers who would align with what you just described and the the piece that is challenging is moving them off of that belief yeah like, it's so deeply rooted and they think they're doing really good things and good work and there's very little open it, openness to mm -hmm. thinking differently yeah about about children um and and they're often the ones whose classrooms you would walk in and you would see children sitting quietly and um children walking in good lines and things like that because that idea of losing control or giving control back to the children feels terrifying mm -hmm. to them like oh my goodness what will happen if dot 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 you know yeah. you like and um and that that just goes back to that question I've been doing a lot of reflection on the question of like how we treat ch children as human mm -hmm. because I, I do think that that's really at the root of all of it is that we don't we see them as something that we have to give like they're a things. commodity <laughs> right and yeah. not as our you know our co-creators or our co-learners or Mm -hmm. And, and any teacher who tells you that they haven't learned something from children are flat out liars. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, to, so that just sort of reminds me, I've never, um, so I was a center director. I did a lot of hiring. I never had anyone come in and tell me that they wanted to work with children because they're big fans of conformity and compliance. Yeah. <laughs> they all have very lofty answers about the ways they want to impact children's lives. Um, but when we get into the classroom, there's a, you know, there's an element of it just being the culture of American child care <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to function in this way, to try and look like school. Um, so they, it's systems again, right? They have these, these great ideals that they want to um, work through with children and for themselves, 
but they get into the system and then it's hard to come back out and remember why you were there or what you really wanted to do with children um, or to accept that there's some learning that you need to do to, about how to, how right. doing that for a three-year-old looks different than doing that for a 10-year-old. Um, so there's lots of, I don't know, there's just so many layers to it. Um, so many layers because yeah. I'm thinking about what you're talking about and I'm thinking about a recent licensing visit that um, because I know the, the <laughs> I got around it. And like, <laughs> um, but they're the, the, we have to keep children safe. Yeah. We have to, we have to keep children, um, you know, that it's, it's a fear-based model of not allowing children, like here in Washington, we have to call the child abuse line. If like a child is running across the playground and breaks their arm. Mm-hmm. Like no other child around him, no negligence yeah. involved. They simply fall and break their arm, but we have to go through a dual process of being investigated by child care services and by licensing. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, it takes a lot of emotional bandwidth to go through something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think because, you know, you look at systems and our workforce is marginalized so deeply that um there there simply isn't the emotional wherewithal to to really fight against this if you don't ever get to rest or any of the other things and so you just say okay fine I'm just so tired here (laughs) do what you want (laughs) well it's the thing right it's the lack of trust that's given to teachers yes and so then they get have a lack of trust for the kids you know like I don't want the kids to do anything because, you know, I'm going to have to make them fill out a form too. No, like Mm -hmm. if they step out of line, you never know that they could run across the playground and trip and break their arms. So they've got to stay in this line. Yeah. Um, Because I can never trust a child to do anything. It's, yeah, it's amazing to me thinking about when I was growing up and there was a lot of kids who weren't in childcare or much less. And a child getting hurt, um, I don't think I've ever told the story on your podcast, Heather. So yeah. my, my mother's, uh, the first advice she got from her mom when she was going to become a mom was to have a red washcloth in a drawer <laughs> because someone's going to fall and get hurt. And if you have a red washcloth and you cover it, it will, the blood won't show. Oh. So it was just assumed that kids are going to fall and get scrapes and, you uh-huh, know, uh-huh. bite their tongue or whatever. Because I do remember the red washcloth biting my tongue and she just got it a little wet, just stuck it there. She could do like pressure, you know, Uh whatever. Um, And it was just that thing of it was assumed. And now that the kids are like with different adults for eight hours a day, of course, kids should be getting, if kids aren't getting scrapes, if they're not, if there's not an occasional bone break, um, we should be worried because it means that kids are not active enough to build the resilience, build the, you know, um, sensory system mm-hmm. that they need. Uh, I mean, let alone their idea of actually doing things. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> um, I, yeah, I go back That's and forth between that kind of, on um, that kind of thinking where, um, people say, well, I just want to say children should have that kind of play and that kind of action and that kind of freedom of movement just because they deserve it just because they're children but if i have to prove it to you i can make a case that there'll be better sitters in school when they get to school and better line standers and better story hearers um from from that you know from the lens that they're Uh looking at them through if they've had those experiences right um so we can we can make a case but also they just deserve it um if, if I have to steal some achievement gap language to make that case, I will. Um, but also they just, they just should have happy childhoods in my mind. Active. And I would argue that they'll be better prepared. Like I, I love to talk to parents about one of the reasons we let children climb trees and, and play in the creek and do all the things is so they're better able. And I'm super risk forward. Like my, my risk ID on a one to 10 is a 10. Like, I'll let <laughs> do just, 
just about anything because uh-huh. they're so capable of doing it right but yeah. it also just like they learn how to keep themselves safe in a way they won't any other way mm-hmm. and do we want a child who's never learned how to assess risk and how to keep themselves safe behind the wheel of a car at 16 right. i mean the older kids get and speaking they... of evidence-based <laughs> there's evidence that not learning to assess risk is one of the riskiest things that you can yeah right. um, that a child can yeah have happen yeah to. And there's also some that suggest that they'll be better readers and better math students and science students if they've had that risky experience because they've learned that I can survive. It might be scary. I might make a mistake, but I'll be okay. Um, And so when they're asked to read out loud or, you know, take a math problem that's unfamiliar. You can never do um, 100% correctly the first time. So you have to have courage to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So building oh. those foundation. I'm sorry, Heather. Go ahead, Rixa. No, go ahead. Building those foundational layers, right? So if you're letting a toddler who's just learning how to walk climb in really safe ways, because man, they they are driven to do that, then and you you give them the opportunity to do that just at the edge of what's safely a risk for them, mm-hmm. then they get that foundational and it keeps building. I had a, a toddler, I just have to share this story because it's just we um in Alaska we had a program and one of the things on our our playground was just a big dirt hill. It was nothing but dirt and um it was big. And we wanted it to be big enough that it would be challenging for children to climb up Uh and come back down um, at whatever age they were. So the preschool one was way bigger than the toddler one. Uh, And then, of course, we provide, you know, because every kid needs, you need Tonka trucks, you need shovels, (laughs) you need rocks, sticks, all the things. So all of that was there too. You need a good stick for climbing, a good walking stick. You need a good stick for (laughs) digging, you need just a good stick for sword fighting. That's a whole other thing. (laughs) Yeah, you you need several good sticks. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, And so these kiddos, there was a group of boys, specifically one who went through our program from the time they started as infants all the way till our school age program. But every summer, and in, in Alaska, summer is short, right? It's about two months of, of really warm enough weather to do some good outdoor water play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. so every summer they'd be on that dirt hill. And every summer, the sophisticated approach to working with the dirt um, advanced, right? So every summer it got exponentially more sophisticated and they went from just running water up and down the hill playing in it sliding in it that kind of thing as toddlers to by the time they were five and ready to go to kindergarten they had these intricate water systems with dams and and bridges and all of these kinds of things that they had built over the course of these four or five summers mm-hmm. and when we asked the kiddo at the end of this time uh, what he wanted to be when he grew up His reply, which that's a whole other question that, right, but um, preschool graduation. But anyway, his answer was really powerful in that he said he wanted to be a dam builder. And so when you think about like, one, he knew what a dam builder was Mm -hmm. and, you know, a civil engineer, that kind of thing. And he knew he had done enough experimentation in that space to know that that was something that really interested him yeah. and he's now he's in junior high now and he gets a's in math just easy yeah i mean and so if we're back to the achievement gap if children are given the space to really dive into these rich play experiences mm-hmm. like that um the space the opportunity the access then all the things that we've talked about today, outdoor play, risk assessment, all of those things are going to close down that perceived achievement gap mm-hmm. until it's non-existent. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's time to start wrapping up because we've been talking for almost yeah. an hour, which is fun. It went so fast. Um, but are there solutions? <laughs> we just, we just talked a lot about what sucks about the achievement gap conversation. Yeah. Um, and we did talk about some things that people could do to, to address it, but do you have ideas? What, what could we, what could we do? Anything? 
I think calendar time would really help. No. Yeah. <laughs> Longer I calendar I think every time times. Rick said, just said. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think also, I think it's important for us to push back <clears throat> on the term. You know, a lot of people use the term opportunity gap. Right. And that and came up like in some of our co communication before recording, and then we haven't really yeah. gotten into and it. And I yeah. do think that's important because, and then to also think outside the system itself. Mm -hmm. It's not everything that Rick's had talked about for inside the classroom, for sure. But the opportunity gap is not what's happening in the classroom. It's what's happening outside the classroom, that what are we doing? What are the opportunities for those parents? Mm -hmm. What are we doing for opportunities um, yeah, for the families themselves, yeah. for the neighborhoods, for the, you know, it just, um, that's going to be the bigger part of that. And then also having the inclusion lens on there too, for the kids who need extra services, right? do they also have those opportunities? Are those things paid for? Because mm -hmm. again, the middle-class kids are going to get those, are more likely to get those services when they need them. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that everyone has those services. Right. Um, so, so yeah, fight yeah. the system. And, and we haven't <laughs> even used the word patriarchy yet. But, uh, no, no, but it's there. <clears throat> and then- well, when you have one person in Congress who is blocking Build Back Better, actually it's two. two. <laughs> You know, yeah. that's just exponentially wow. way too, too much power. Yeah. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating from the perspective of the sheer volume of money that's in there for kind of dismantling some of mm -hmm. these things. Right. Yeah. Kind of helps and, and I think that's part of it is we need the conversation to be about what would this do? Because most of the news I saw was about those two senators and the process. Right. And how do we convince those two senators not, yeah. do people think that we should, um, that kids should have a space to go yeah. where they can be four-year-olds or three-year-olds? And, mm -hmm. you know, we can. Sure. Ron Johnson doesn't for the record. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's, sure. I mean, but, it's, but, it's two democratic people. senators blocking it, but it's like 48 other senators who aren't on board with it either. Right. That, so that it's a big. A it's that a big a mind changing. Really endeavor. good point. There's 52 people we have to convince, not mm -hmm. just two. But yeah. at the same time, when you talk to people, and if you talk about individual things, oh, do you think children deserve to have a place where they um, can um, have care? Yeah. Yes. Do you think the people who give that care should be above the poverty line? You do. Okay. Um, <laughs> should we, you know, like, should, um, parents be able to go to work mm -hmm. and not worry about where their kids are at because it's funded well the male oh, you do the, the male parents should be <laughs> yeah well, that's what i was just yeah now we're into patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's patriarchy part. but even yeah. without the patriarchy most people agree with those things in yeah. the polls including that people shouldn't spend more than seven percent of their income yeah. on child care but the people who work there should be getting paid the right. same as elementary school teachers both of those things are very popular yeah among Democrats and Republican voters. Mm -hmm. um, so then it depends much more on, you know, other, we get into the systems thing, so. Yeah. The systems feel just insurmountable, but I, I will say we've seen a little bit of movement here in Washington um, with some of the legislation that's come out. It's not quite as far as uh, we would like it. You guys have had to Tiffany Pearsall, um, yeah. she and I talk all the time yeah. about just, it needs to go a lot farther. Mm -hmm. And at least it's budged, you know, and I, um, my, my solution is just to continue to lift up programs that really connect um, children of all socioeconomic backgrounds and things to nature, to opportunities to mm -hmm. access to all of those types of things that's that's what I'm doing from my space mm -hmm. is you know utilizing social media as much as I can elevating voices and things like that and I I 
it, it's really easy. And I think you guys can probably both relate to this to get kind of mired in the muck of like, yeah. nothing's ever going to change. Yes. <laughs> so you try to, <laughs> I try I'm to actually say, digging my way out of one of those. <laughs> yeah. Right about yeah. now. Yeah. Just trying to stay outside of it a little bit yeah. and find joy in my work. I think that that finding joy is a, um, uh, an automatic pushback mm-hmm. because it, it's, um, just showing people, Hey, you haven't gotten me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I'm going to talk about a, a positive one in that is of my, the center I work at. It's, it's, it's a bit larger. Um, our agency is very large in terms of other therapeutics we offer young children, but uh, I really appreciated my own boss. Cause of course there's parents who are worried about, are they going to be ready for school right. and things like that? And so they, what my boss's reaction was, Mike, you need to write an article every month for our newsletter explaining why play, you know, Mm -hmm. is the route to go for this and why it's important for, you know, inclusive environments too. And um, next week we're doing a literally one about the kindergarten transition. Mm -hmm. Some of it's just literally, here's how you, you know, apply for the different schools. And we're kind of right in between a few school districts. So explaining some of the mechanics and then like, and you're going to do great, you know, like, <laughs> because yeah. um, the, my, my boss always refers to it as we take the long view. We want kids to have successful lives. We aren't worried if their kindergarten scores, naming colors are wrong. And I just love the long view because it's yeah. something, it seems to resonate with parents. Mm-hmm. We aren't just trying to get your kid to pass kindergarten, whatever that means. We want your kids to be really like happy as high schoolers. We want them to be happy as young adults. We want them to be happy as future parents. We want them, you know, like, like yeah. want them to be happy as the people who are going to be taking care of us in our home. Exactly. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that parents are the answer to a lot of these um, topics where we get frustrated, whether it's play or recognizing the importance of care or yeah, just getting rid of this garbage language about gaps. Um, if we can, cause they're all coming from a place where they're, they want to advocate for their child's success, but they've been marketed to in such a way that they think that means letter shapes, um, flashcards, um, tablets with special programs, those kinds of things. So the more we can show them what's happening in our programs and how that could benefit them down the road and could feed into the goals they have for their children then we get their voices involved too and it might just be me and my 14 families and mike you and your 120 or whatever you've got in your program and you know whatever you have ricks up but but that that's that will ripple out i think that's key to so much of what we want to accomplish for young children and ourselves as as people in the field yeah it's you know as an independent school we are marketed toward a certain socioeconomic group. Um, and my thought is d- deeply tied into that because the people with the bigger platforms, if they start talking about it, then they may connect with somebody who actually has a power to move the needle in some way. Mm-hmm. But what we're also hearing is a lot of these families that are coming in now, granted, they have the privilege to be able to do this, but they're asking for these really open-ended classrooms, a lot of outdoor uh-huh. time, things like that. And so there's a recognition, I think, within a certain socioeconomic group mm-hmm. that has the privilege to be able to access it, yeah. that, that those things are important. And I think now what we need to do is it needs to get pushed to just very broadly, all children have uh-huh. a fundamental right. right to these experiences. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I should say the main kindergarten that our families go to, and we have a school forest and, you know, a lot of outdoor stuff, they've announced that starting next year, the kindergarten classes will happen outdoors, I think like half the day or something. Wow. Yeah. So they're like, so it's like, oh, oh actually, I, until you were talking, Rick, I hadn't thought about the stuff we've been doing with our parents probably has influenced the school because mm-hmm. they're, those parents from last year have been the ones talking it's like oh yeah. yeah it is little little baby steps and it is also in a wealthier neighborhood but our you know our center's hope is um moving into other communities 
we used to be a little bit and the pandemic kind of mm. <laughs> The what programs didn't the are a little pandemic too, yeah. The, the programs are a little <laughs> too new to survive, so and too small to survive. Mm -hmm. So we're starting from square one again. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, then it's every kid deserves it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was great. <laughs> that hour flew by, but I think it's probably about as long as people are gonna listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thanks, Rixa, for joining us and for the suggestion Absolutely. to take this on Thank as a you topic. For having me. Yeah, and as always, yeah, Mike, thanks for being along too. Yeah. Um, so we will be back next week with another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. And thank you for listening to this episode. We will see you later.